Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome along. Today, I'm David McNeil. I'm your MC today uh, for the press conference. Well, in the last year or so, uh, almost uh, 1,000 uh, men have come forward to say that they were uh, abused by Johnny Kitagawa, arguably Japan's most powerful entertainment mogul. Uh, the abuse allegations go back over five decades. The company that Kitagawa founded, Johnny and Associates, has been forced to close, and the management has formed a new company called Smile Up to handle compensation victims. Uh, this entire process was uh, arguably kick-started by our two guests on the screen who've uh, got up very early in London, I think, to, uh, to join us today. Their uh, blockbuster BBC documentary last year included interviews with several of Kitagawa's victims, including Kawan Okamoto, who subsequently gave a press conference here at the FCCJ almost exactly a year ago. Uh, from there, the story was picked up by the Japanese media, and the code of omerta, or silence, surrounding Kitagawa's wrongdoings was broken forever. Uh, the two speakers, uh, Mobin Azar and Megumi uh, Inman, are here again today to discuss the fresh allegations that they have made in their documentary, which you've just seen an extract from. They, uh, two more as individuals were sexually abused at Johnny and Associates, of course. Their latest documentary uh, includes victims saying that the process set up for compensating uh, victims is slow and opaque. And of course, you've also seen claims that the company is trying to deflect uh, by saying that some of the claims are fraudulent. So my job is to get out of the way as always and let the speakers speak. Uh, I don't know who's going to go first. Is it Megumi or Megumi? Yeah. Okay, so Megumi's going to go first. They're going to make a statement and then we'll uh, leave it. We'll open up to questions. Megumi, on the Hi, thank you very much, David. Um, hi, everyone. And, and thank you to the FCCJ again for having us here. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, as David said, a year ago, we were here with the release of Predator, uh, The Secret Scandal of J-Pop, which was a documentary that investigated the sexual allegations against Johnny Kitagawa. Um, and since that broadcast, I think a lot has happened and we can see some changes, some of which, again, David has mentioned. Um, but uh, I think one of the big ones is that uh, the allegations against Johnny Kitagawa are no longer a taboo. We're talking about that openly now. Johnny and Associates uh, of course, has dissolved and Julie Fujishima has resigned. But I also think that there is um, hopefully a greater awareness of how systemic sexual abuse can take place, um, what grooming is, and also around um, male sexual abuse too. Good morning. It's really good to be with you or good afternoon for you. Um, I think as we saw these changes, it'd be fair to say we were really pleased with the impact that Predator had. But we also had uh, a lot of questions and week on week, month on month, we saw these headlines and we, of course, were watching them from afar. We were watching them from London and we were seeing this story unfold. And as it unfolded, I'd say for every question that there was an attempt to answer, there were many more questions that arose. So primarily those questions were around things like the treatment of survivors. Uh, in the introduction, David, you referenced that almost a thousand men have now come forward to smile up, saying that there were survivors of abuse, that they were abused by Johnny Kitagawa. So we had really serious questions about that process, how those individuals were being treated, and the process in terms of how and if they were being compensated. We also had questions about the care towards talent today. And that was fueled by many of the discussions online. It was fueled by some of the stories. It was also fueled by individuals who had historically worked at the agency, who'd been in touch with myself and, and Megumi as well. I'd say there were also major questions about the possibility of other abusers within the company. And the, the major question of if this all came down to one individual, Johnny Kitagawa, who of course many people at the time said, you know, he he is dead and therefore there isn't any accountability. Did this problem indeed die with him or was there a, a culture of abuse that had continued after he'd gone or, you know, were there other people at the company at the time? So all of those questions led us to the making 
of the follow-up documentary, The Shadow of a Predator. We were over in Japan in February to film that. It went out, of course, at the end of March, alongside an extended interview with Noriyuki Higashiyama, uh, which is available on the BBC Japan YouTube page. Once again, we are really grateful to everyone that contributed. So primarily, that's everyone that's been affected by the abuse and the family members of those who've been affected by the, uh, by the abuse. We really realized whilst we were making this story that the, the, the subject matter is in need of uh, a lot of TLC within Japan. And this story is, is far from over. It is still in many ways an unfolding story. And as a result of that, I think we both feel indebted to people who continue to speak out. We feel indebted to the press that continues to cover this story uh, inside Japan. And I think we want to ensure from a moral perspective that that pressure doesn't evaporate and that the story continues to be reported on. I know you've all just seen the film, so um, I'll stop talking and I'll open up for, for uh, questions, if that's okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for those opening statements. Okay, well, we, uh, we're we opening it up to questions. If you would like to ask a question, just indicate by showing your hand and uh, come to the microphone. Ideska? If, uh, while they're... Yeah? Uh, Japanese, okay. Do we have an interpreter? No. All right, yeah, those are. すみません、東京新聞の望月と申します。えっ、ー、と聞きたい点はですね、え二、ー、人別のジャニー喜多川以外の加害者を東山さんが認識しているときって、えー、モビン記者が非常に驚いていました。で警察に情報提供しないのかと再三繰り返し聞いても、えー、そのことについてはまあ。オプションの一つという言い方をして、まあ、現在でも警察に届けているような状況ではないようです、まあ、このことについて感じること、それから今、日本の警視庁を含め、警察ですね、捜査機関がこのことについてまだ調査している、捜査しているという話もありません、この状況をどう思うか、そして4月から、今月から、日本の中では新たに10本のスマイルアップ所属のジャニーズ事務所所属だったタレントたちが新たな主役などを張るテレビが始まっている、この今の日本のメディアの状況をどう思うか、この3つをお願いします。So, so I'm going to interpret. Uh, 望月 from 東京,東京新聞。And first of all, she wanted to ask、uh, Mr. Mobin other that the, when you interviewed、uh, 東山 Mr. 東山 he told you that the, he is aware of two other suspects. But he asked about whether he's going to put those information forward to the police. He kind of refused and uh, uh, tried to uh, uh, get out of the, running out of the question. And he didn't commit to a report to the police. And that, so, what's your sense on those、uh, reactions? That's the number one question. The second one is that the, when it comes to the police investigation, Japanese police hasn't at all moved.、Uh, Try to、uh, investigate anything on Johnny Associate matter, in spite of the, the new, new, new fact that the, they are aware of two other suspects who, is, uh, still, who are still alive today. So, what, what do you make of the, those uh,、um, uh, action or inaction by、uh, police department in Japan, perhaps compared to the London police in the case of the, the Jimmy Savile? And the third, third So now,、uh, Johnny, Johnny and Associate, also they changed the name. They back, kind of back on tra track with the help, huge help from the TV stations. And the Japanese TV stations are now airing two, 10 new other, 10 new, new TV programs starring、uh, Johnny and Associate, former、uh, talent. So, what do you make of those?、Uh, uh, At the action by Japanese media, especially TV stations. Thank you so much for your questions. So, I think primarily in regard to the first question and the interview with Higashi Yama san, I, I got the real sense of an individual who may have lots of good intention, but is, is not equipped to deal with the magnitude 
of what has happened and these ongoing allegations. Uh, I was really shocked, actually, by the, the candid response when we posed the question about possible other abusers. He was very aware and he, he volunteered this information that there were two other people that an internal investigation had uh, had uncovered. And as you referenced, he went on to say this information hadn't been passed on to the police. He very much saw it as the responsibility of the individuals, as you will have seen in, in the film just now, the individuals who were making the allegations. And to his credit, he said, if they take this information to the police, Smile Up will cooperate. I have to say, from my perspective, this is simply not good enough because we know um, from speaking to survivors of abuse in any context, and certainly in a Japanese context, there is a huge amount of stigma if someone has experienced abuse. I know from speaking to individuals that many of these people found it very, very difficult to speak to their, their families, their wives, up until this day, that information hasn't been shared in some of these cases. So if you can imagine the, the weight and the difficulty in taking information like that and reporting it to the police, I think we all, and Smile Up in particular, who have of course been tasked with delivering compensation and supporting survivors of abuse, need to take on some of that burden. And that means facilitating these complaints and facilitating uh, justice. And in order for justice, any semblance of justice to be uh, achieved, these individuals must be encouraged to report what happened to the police. I do want to reference one very specific thing that Higashi Yamasan was asked during the interview if the alleged new abusers are still alive. And he confirmed that they are, which to me suggests that there needs to be a thorough investigation. And if that results in police action and convictions, then that can only be a good thing. Um, in regard to the second part of that question, can I hand over to you, Magumi? Would that would that be okay? So the second yeah, question sure. is about I think the second... just, just to refresh. The second question is about police inaction. Yep. Can I? I, I was going to hand over to you about the 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 uh, start to and and kind of where we are now. But if I answer the second part of that question first, and then Magumi, you go for the third. So in terms of police inaction, I would not for a second, and I've, I've been very careful during this whole process. I would not for a second hold up the UK as uh, a model. So I'm not suggesting it, you know everything would be dealt with in a textbook perfect way in the UK. I do know, however, um, that after the, the many allegations were made about Jimmy Savile, of course, there's comparisons there because Jimmy Savile was also dead. He was deceased. And there were many people in the public space who would speak about this idea that justice was elusive and had been evaded uh, because because he was dead. However, I do know there were police investigations. They didn't result in, in, in convictions, of course. But in that case, you didn't have allegations about abusers who were possibly alive. And in this instance, I would really appeal to the police to, to, to work with Smile Up. And if Smile Up can facilitate those conversations with the individuals that have made these allegations, I think that would be a really good way forward. I mean, many of the individuals we've spoken to have spoken about inaction and not feeling that the police were, were necessarily wanting to, to hear them in the past. And I think that's a, that's a real problem. So I would welcome action from the police in Japan. Megumi, do you want to add something to that? No, not to not to Mabin's points. He's I think he's um, summarized really well. Uh, but just to briefly talk about the third question, which if I could get a refresh, I think it was about the the media's environment. It was about that right? well, it was about the fact that although the company has been uh, terminated and renamed, it's now called Smile Up. Uh, it seems to be back on track with the media, and there are multiple relationships between the new company and TV companies. And the figure quoted was that there are 10 new TV programs featuring talent from Smile Up. I think I got that right. So what's your opinion of that? Um, I think that um, as uh, I, I, so I, I realized that some t TV companies um, are working with former John Yoon Associates or Smile Up 
talents um, and some companies are not. What I think is important is that this story is not over and that is continue to be reported in the news. Um, uh, I think also a clarification over what the difference between Smile Up and Star 2 is um, needs to be uh, had as well. I don't think that's something that's still sort of it's uh, been set very clearly. Um, so I think in that respect, um, the media still have an important role to play in continuing to investigate and report on um, on this story. Can I just add one thing very briefly, which is I, I want to make it really clear, and this is in response to the question, but also in response to some of the online chatter that I've seen. In terms of these documentaries, this was has never been about and should never be about talent at the company, be it historic or, or, or be it talent that's there today at Star 2. It's never been about those individuals. And, you know, I certainly don't think it's helpful if we make those individuals, the people that are, you know, the, the acts themselves, persona non grata, it is not about targeting those individuals. It's about a company. And I think there's serious questions that remain about financial benefits in the country, in, in, in the company. And that includes to individuals like Judy Fujishima. I think there's serious questions there that remain. And so I think what is very difficult in this situation is if there are survivors of abuse who are still awaiting compensation and we know there are many many who are going through that process and they are seeing that talent from the agency is on television every day i think that would stick in the throat of many people and so i think there needs to be a degree of sensitivity in terms of of the company itself making it very clear how the culture has changed who is financially benefiting and why they deem it okay to, to roll out this talent, but it has never been about targeting the individual talent. I just want to make that really clear. Thank you. If if we just um, continue the comparison with the BBC and Jimmy Savile, um, there were, of course, uh, multiple programs, several programs after he died investigating what he did. Um, are you aware of any program like that in Japan? So in other words, an investigative program, which kind of dug into the claims and presented them to the public uh, in a broadcast forum. Um, I'm thinking in particular of NHK because there have been, similar to the Jimmy Savile case, there have been claims, I've seen them uh, in the news, that s at least one victim was actually abused in, in the NHK building. Is that right? Um, so I have come across and watched some of those uh, documentaries. Uh, I think NHK did a series on Close Up Gendai and uh, TBS also did too. Well, the impression I got was that they were sort of looking into, they were Kinshaw programs, so looking into um, uh, the their company's uh, response or and relationship with um, with Johnny and Associates. Um, what hasn't happened though is a is an actual f formal investigation, um, an external investigation into each of these broadcasters or. Um, companies so it's sort of been left to i think the the journalists within the company to 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 do programs themselves that's good that's great but i do think that there needs to be also an external um investigation happening um uh, as well as journalists who are within the company and trying to find out what's going on um in their own company thank you and megumi did you did i catch you saying that some TV companies are not cooperating with Smile Up. Is that right, or it was, did I mishear that? Oh no, I don't think I, <clears throat> I. I don't think I meant to say that. Okay, so as as far as aware, it's back on track. It's what the questioner said. The TV companies are kind of acting like nothing has changed. They're they're trying to move forward with Smile Up, or would that be an exaggeration? Um, I think it's uh. I've, it's difficult to say because being in London, I'm not following everything so closely, but it does feel like uh, the whilst there are lots of, as we've, as we've uh, found, there are lots of questions to still be answered, still um, uh, big issues related to Smile Up. Um, those questions are not being answered and uh, it feels like uh, a new company has been set up and we can move on. 
Okay. Um, I'm just scanning the room for more questions. I'm just going to take other questions, if you don't mind. I see Karen's hand on the back. I see Alice so and the lady in front. So if we take one, two, three, is that all right? <clears throat> Karen first. I'm Karin from Japan Times, and I have two questions. Um, by the way, thank you for today. Um, so, like the sexual abuse accusations against other predators, whom I believe are like former managers, has been alleged since last year. It was included in the third party investigation report in August. And I believe Shu Kambunshun also reported a story about the former predator as like Mr. X. Um, Considering that it's been going on since like last year, do you think there's a, a lack of media coverage within the Japanese media focusing on other predators? And as for my second question, I was um, one of the victims, Nihongi-san. I think he mentioned that he knows the name of the former the predators. So I was wondering if you tried, um, did you consider including them in your documentary, and have you tried reaching out to them? That's it from me. Sure. If, if I could take the, the first part of that question, if that would be okay. So I, I think there's something very telling, and I'm, I mean this, and I'm going to be very careful with, with my words, and I, I want to maintain absolute respect for, for journalists on the ground in, in Japan who have been covering this story. But I think there's something very telling in that every interview that I've done since uh, the release of The Shadow of a Predator, so in, in the last few weeks since the end of March, Every Japanese journalist that I've spoken to has referenced the fact that the information about there being possible other predators, other abusers within the company, they have referenced the fact that this was in the public domain. And indeed, in terms of why we started chasing that story, it's because it was reported in an internal investigation. And if, if you looked at that investigation, it was, it was like a footnote. It was a very small reference. I, I think it didn't even make up an entire paragraph. It was a couple of lines that referenced that there, there, there may have been other abusers within the company. And every single journalist in Japan that I've spoken to in recent weeks has said that they wish they'd picked up on that story. And so I still today feel, and I think this is a really crucial point, that as people, as, as a non-Japanese speaker, as someone that works for the BBC, as someone that is not resident in Japan, I still feel that there is, there's a great deal of, of privilege almost in us being able to come to Japan and cover this story. But what I would like to see and what I'm unsure of in terms of why it's happened this way, with the exception of certain publications, so Bunchen, for example, who've been doing you know brilliant, brilliant work around this, with the exception of a few broadcasters or a few publications, people on the ground don't seem to be running with this story. And I feel that when this report was published, that was the story that the Japanese press itself could have and should have absolutely run with. And I'm, I'm really unsure, perhaps it's a cultural reason, I'm not sure, I'm really unsure why that didn't happen. And what I would like to see moving forward is journalists in Japan not waiting for the BBC or for external organizations to take the lead on this story. This story is there for the taking and I want to see people on the ground running with it. Thank you. Uh, the second question? Sorry, could you repeat the second question? Karen, do you want it? Yeah, um, so one of the victims, Nihongi-san, he mentioned that he knows the names of the former predators, I mean, the predators who are like former managers. And I was wondering if you, um, did you consider including them, the predators, in your story? Or have you tried reaching out to them? Because I don't know if you um, get to know the names of the predators, but yeah, I was just wondering about that. No, that's that's a really uh, uh, important, interesting question. On this occasion, um, we didn't go down that road, but uh, we think it is really, really important that it is taken, um, that it's been looked into and uh, investigated further. Mobin, do you have anything to add? <clears throat> yeah, just that I, I'm completely aware of a name in particular, which I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say today, but a name in particular, which has been circulating 
uh, in in a small section of the press and certainly in the online space. Um, and you know, we're not in a position today to to confirm or say, you know, this is information we have about a particular individual because we don't. But that is absolutely a story I'd like to see the Japanese press run with and explore. I think that's an important part of, of public service journalism inside Japan. So there is a name in the public domain, but it hasn't been properly checked out or investigated. It, exactly, exactly. So it would just be an allegation at this point. All right. Thanks, Karen. Is that all right? Yeah, thank you yeah. so much. Uh, Alice was up next, I think, and then the lady in front. Hi, Alice French from Nick Asia. Thanks very much, Mabin and Megumi, for today and for your work um, over the past year. I have two questions, if I may. Um, the first one speaks to what you were just saying, Mabin, um, which is that there is an overall sense here that the company wouldn't have taken public responsibility for the scale of Kitagawa's abuse, let alone considered offering compensation were it not for your original documentary last year. And uh, former President Fujishima actually admitted so in a press conference last September. Um, and arguably you have had, again, maybe not quite sure why, but you have had more access to the company than a lot of domestic journalists. And I just want to ask whether you have any sense of perhaps resentment from the company towards the BBC for taking this public, or on the other side of that, have you seen any, I suppose, signs of remorse from them or perhaps even gratitude for um, opening this up and, and giving them a chance to, to talk about it? My second question um, is about the business or kind of economic impact the scandal has had on the company. Um, obviously, it's not publicly listed, and so it's quite difficult to figure out sort of how well it's going or not. Um, in your discussions with Higashiyama and people at Smile Up, did you get a sense that this was a company that was really sort of in a crisis and trying to save itself? Um, just from watching your interview, Higashiyama seemed very calm and collected and he doesn't really seem like someone who's panicking to save his business. Thanks. Sure. Thank you so much. And uh, Megumi, if I could take the first part of that question, if that if that's okay. So um, I think I think there's a, a really interesting point here about uh, how the company has responded. As as we all saw when we were there during the making of the first documentary, there was uh, what I would call a, a brick wall. So there was uh, pretty much non-engagement. I think that really changed significantly um, this time around, and I think that is entirely to do uh, with with the level of pressure. And uh, of course, a lot of that is to do with the press in Japan running with this story. So, you know, when when we approached them, they sent this one line email back saying we will cooperate. I do want to share though this idea of, you know, I think you asked specifically about remorse and I want to share an anecdote, which I think probably shed some light on that. I, I don't feel there's resentment from the company, but I also need to be very clear. I, I don't think there is a, a, a real grasp on the magnitude of what has happened and the idea that the, the company and the culture within the company has a part to play in that. So if I can share this anecdote, when we arrived in Japan in, in February, um, we did not know at that point if the company CEO or anyone senior from the company would be speaking to us. We just knew that there was a move to cooperate, whatever that might mean. And so we had a series of meetings uh, off camera inside the headquarters, the former Johnny and Associates headquarters. And in those meetings, I would say some of the content of those very long meetings was, was bizarre. And so I remember, you know, initially that we'd have these meetings around a big board, in a big boardroom around a big table, there'd be external PR, internal PR, there'd be lawyers, there'd be friends of senior people at the company who would turn up to an express an opinion and quite early on in that process they said to us we'd like you to meet some survivors of abuse and of course we're very open to speaking to any survivors of abuse the the format that that took i think was was wrong because they insisted that the meetings with survivors of abuse would take place within the building with the the pr team present and actually there was quite a bit of back and forth because we went to them and said look in terms of any survivors we've spoken to for research purposes, we really insist and we really want to make sure that 
able to speak openly and honestly. And that would mean there would be no camera there. It would mean there's no third parties there. It would mean there's no one to apply any pressure. And we would feel that it, you know, it, it wouldn't be a good thing for that to happen in, in the office. They came back to us and said, this is the way they want to do it. This is the way these survivors themselves want to do it. And then we had another meeting where indeed three survivors of abuse were effectively wheeled out. And in these conversations, they told us that we had the wrong story. So this is with the PR team present. They said, whilst there were survivors of abuse, they wanted us to focus on, in, in their view, what were the many lies of, of people coming forward, the fact that um, you know there were so many people exploiting the situation. Um, it, it really felt like they were trying to minimize what had happened. And that to me illustrates a point about company culture today, not historically, company culture today, because what I found was a company that is still obsessed primarily with public relations and reputational management. And that tells me that they haven't fully grasped the magnitude of what happened and the impact it's had on so many lives. Thank you. Um, Megumi, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I don't. And I think that also answered um, uh, the second question as well. And, and um, you know, I was in the room too. I think um, Higashi yama he, he he answered our, all our questions. Um, it was a long interview and uh, we asked some difficult questions too. And, and, and you know, we did get the sense that he, he, he wants to help, wants to change, but... Um, uh yeah we I, I was also left with a very strong impression that he's just not grasping the gravity um of the situation that they're in um and you know Mabin just gave examples of why we felt that and just the, just to say in terms of the economic impact i certainly yeah. don't have um i don't think we have access to you know anything like company accounts i do know that during the interview i think it's in the extended cuts higashi yamasan said he took on this role because he felt that so many people would would lose their jobs and that he felt it was his his responsibility it was quite i would go as far as saying it was quite a a, a paternal kind of take on why he was doing this job he seemed to present it with some sense of self sacrifice uh as if he was kind of saving the company so i don't know if i i think the implication there at least was there has been a financial impact but we don't have any details on the specifics is that a story that a, a journalist could dig into, do you think? I mean, I know it's not a public company. I think ab absolutely. So I would, you know, in terms of financial journalists and data journalists inside Japan, I think it is really worth looking at if there has been any financial impact. I do have to say, you know, and th this is definitely in the extended cut. One of the questions I asked about finance is if Julie Fujishima, you know, of course, the, the former CEO who resigned and Johnny Kitagawa's niece, if she financially benefits today from Star 2 and Smile Up, and uh, he, he wouldn't answer that question. And so, you know, the, the fact is, and this, again, and this is a matter of public record, this information is out there, that uh, Julie Fudoshima still, she owns the company. You know, she owns the company even to this day, and this is someone who it was, was part of the family and, has been around and been in the company and been a senior figure at the company for a very, very long time, whilst we know this abuse was continuing. So I think, that, again, there's a moral question there about the, the ethics of that and whether that should continue. I really want someone in Japan to consider this and to run with the story. Thank you. Uh, the lady at the front, you're waiting for a question? Hi, uh, I am Amane Shimazaki from Asas Shimbun. Thank you for today. And my question is about uh, Start Entertainment. So Start Entertainment is doing a big uh, live concert uh, today in Tokyo. And although the Start Entertainment and Smile Up have separated their businesses, but there, uh, the compensation issue still underway and the sexual assault by the two staff members uh, still being relieved. So some victims uh, have expressed mixed feeling 
about having this kind of live concert. So what do you think about doing a big concert at this time? Thank you. So it's another kind of business as usual question. It does seem like they're, they're trying to go on as if nothing has happened. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think. Um, uh, I, I, it's a really sensitive topic, isn't it? Because there are so many, as we know, there are nearly a thousand uh, survivors that have come forward to smile up, and they're still going through a compensation process. In the mean, uh, meanwhile, uh, there is a huge launch party uh, concert happening as well. So it does feel rather insensitive. Um, and uh, as always, it's it's. Um, uh, I think the the standing by the survivors and helping them achieve a sense of justice is the most important thing. Thank you. Mobin, do you want to add anything to that? <clears throat> yeah, I think just, just very briefly, again, you know, this isn't about the individuals and in response to some of the conversations that I've seen online, it's important to say that we are not for a second suggesting that individuals who you know might not even have been born when some of this abuse was taking place should bear the responsibility for that. I do think though that there's major questions about the ethics of, of, of a company splitting and having two different arms of the company because it benefits them financially and allows them to continue business as usual, particularly when we know that there are there are lawyers, for example, who are representing survivors of abuse who said that the, the whole process is like a black box. And so if you can imagine people who've been brave enough to come forward, not knowing what the result of their claim is going to be, not knowing a time frame, if you imagine some of those people turning on the television or seeing billboards for these concerts, I think that feels really insensitive. And it feels like the company has its priorities wrong, actually. So, you know, perhaps there could be some system in which there is a pause on all the fanfare and a pause on business as usual. And they deal primarily with compensating survivors of abuse. I think, I think that might be a more ethical way to, to move forward. Thank you. And presumably you did ask uh, Fujishima-san, I should say, to, to come on camera, did you? And she declined. Absolutely. There was a, a long conversation and multiple negotiations around Judy Fujishima speaking on camera and um, for, for various reasons, which I think it would be un, probably unfair to, to share publicly, but for various reasons that they, they declined and uh, suggested Higashi Yama-san would be the, the best representative. Thank you. Okay, just scanning the room. Uh, this gentleman, Ogawa-san, you've had a question before, but if there's no other hands, Dozo. Hi, I'm Toshi Ogata with Arc Times. Uh, thank you for doing this today. I have two questions. So, uh, you, Mobin, you just mentioned that the, the whole process is a kind of black box, and uh, they claim that the former, like a John and associate, will be dissolved and they're going to create, they have create, created Smile Up and Star Entertainment. And they claim that the Star Entertainment and Smile Up is totally different company. But they did, didn't give us any details on that, and they refused to do so. And the, one of the reasons why you did uh, The Predator last year was that one of the major themes was a break of, a break of silence of, break of, uh, break of silence by Japanese media. And actually, the, the black box, so what I mean by that is uh, the relation between Smile Up and uh, Star Entertainment. Well, that was, uh, the Star Entertainment was partly uh, created by the request by Japanese TV stations. It, Japanese TV station executives uh, explicitly said that in the press conferences that they wanted the company to separate. But that's a, just a superficial separ separation, but they wanted them to do so. Then all those uh, TV networks executives uh, are now saying that the compensation is in progress. They use a ho all, almost all the same expression when they express the, what's going on right now. So given the fact that you saw the victims and survivors, 
And, but at the same time, it seems to me Japanese TV station is now back in the, the business as usual and even cooperating with Johnny Associates to cover up the whole things. What do you make of the, the, the situation right now and the break, break, uh, break of silence walls by Japanese media, but especially by TV stations are now, what, what's going on? What, what's your, what do you make of the, the situation right now? That's my first question. And second one is that the, uh, so you, Mobin, you interviewed Higashiyama and uh, in the interview you use expression like a bring justice. Uh, I, I think I've ju the, the word justice several times. But uh, for Higashiyama, it seems to me his justice only turned to the internal staffers or his colleagues. And, but you use the expression, bring justice to Johnny and Associates for victims. I think there was a huge uh, gap or con conception gap between the, the, the two, between you and Higashima. What, what, what did you feel about that? Sure, I really so, appreciate your, your question. So the, the first part of that, um, I think you highlight something really, really important and crucial, which could explain, uh, I think, a lot of the frustrations uh, that I was expressing earlier about the, the Japanese press not running with this. And I believe that there is a, a symbiotic relationship between uh, the world of television and entertainment and entertainment programs. And formerly Johnny and Associates today start to, and, 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 and less so smile up, but there is this symbiotic relationship, which means that the, the kind of constant supply of of uh, people who have debuted for dramas, for music shows, for concerts, for content on talk shows, there is this kind of um, production line. And the scandal upset that production line. That's what it did. It, it for a second, it, or, or for a few months at least, it hit pause and the, the conversation in some circles shifted from it being about this kind of dream world of constant entertainment and perfection to being about the under the the ugly underbelly actually of, of what was going on inside the company now i think there are many people within the entertainment industry outside of of the company and outside of star two who who want this to simply go away because it harms the business model it harms the idea that there is this perfect world in which these people you know, purely their, their purpose in life is just to entertain us all. As we know, that isn't the case. We're talking about human beings here. And so I think there needs to be a, a, a real shift. And I, I personally believe, and this is from speaking to many of the journalists who I've done interviews with inside Japan and Japanese journalists in the UK as well. So many of them will then have a conversation with me about how even today it is difficult to have conversations around this kind of subject matter with their editors, because there remains a fear, there remains a fear even now of who might be upset and how that could lead to access being broken down to particular stars. And I think that is a, a real problem and is, is the primary reason that we've seen the rate of change be so slow. And can I just get a reminder about the second part of that question? The second okay. question was about the gulf in perception during the interview you had yeah, with, justice. Yeah. Yeah, with yes, Higashi yeah. Yamasan Com over the concept completely. of justice. Completely. So um, I, I don't want to repeat myself um, from, from earlier too much, but I, I really felt that Higashi Yamasan is, of course, someone who has come through the Johnny and Associates system. He's someone that was very closely linked to Johnny Kitagawa himself, and he is a star within his own rights. And because of all that, I understand why he could be a figurehead for this company. What I do not understand is how he is qualified in any meaningful way to understand and to deliver justice for survivors of abuse. It's just not his area of expertise. And as a result of that, I completely agree with there was a huge gap between what I was asking about and implying and what I was talking about when we referenced individuals we'd spoken to and the quest for justice and what justice looks like. There was a huge gap between that and what Higashi Yamasan believed justice looked like. For him, you know, the, he, he did speak a lot about staff at the company and ensuring that they had jobs moving forward, 
ensuring that the the company's legacy would be changed and all of those things. I think from the survivor's perspective, it's more about allowing some form of closure. And what do we know about that? That that requires, it's not only about money, although part of this is about money, it's also about things like counseling. It's also about things like support in terms of being able to speak to their families. And also, you know, in, in regard to people who are coming forward and saying there were other abusers, in those instances, it's also about criminality and people being held accountable. And all of those things are things that higashiyama san didn't really engage with. Just, just quickly, did you submit I, your I question can't allow beforehand? You, I before can't the allow interview? you to monopolize the press conference, sorry. Just, uh, just a quick, because Last there was question. a lot, lot of, lot of, lot of uh, uh, speculation that the, whether you submit questions before you meet with Higashiyama. How, how you, because you, you mentioned long meeting took place beforehand, yes. so. Yeah, so, so just to be really brief, we were very clear from the word go that we would not submit questions. We said to them that we would um, allow them to understand question areas uh, and those would cover things like the quest for justice, the experience of survivors. But we said that we, we wanted the interview to be an, an open conversation and therefore it, it would be ridiculous to suggest that we would have a, a set list of questions. It just wouldn't work. So although it was requested, we we refused to, to submit questions. Thank you. Any more questions from the room? If you would like to ask a question, can you uh, raise your hand, indicate, please? Um, while we're waiting, just let me um, ask a very sensitive question. But did you feel that you needed to ask Higashi Yamasan himself if he was a victim, or did you think that was just off the off the record, or off the cards? It's it's really interesting you raise that. So in the extended cut, you you do see uh, the moment, and I, I'm very careful with my wording. So I say to him, I only want to, uh, I only want you to answer this if you're comfortable. And then I ask him if uh, I ask him if he had any experiences uh, of abuse with Johnny Kitagawa, and he 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 absolutely says he didn't, and he was very quick to answer that. So I was I was careful to make sure that he was comfortable, but he did answer the question. All right, thank you. Um, can we just go back to the issue of the police? Did you, were you able to approach the police, or um, did you not think that that was in your remit? I mean, it is uh, kind of odd, I guess, that the police have not launched a formal investigation, right? Now, now of course, uh, the main perpetrator is dead, so there is that. But in the wake of Jimmy Savile, there was a police investigation, wasn't there, into his historic crimes, and that uncovered more new crimes, yeah? So are you able, to, I know it's outside your expertise, you're a long way away, but are you able to comment on the sort of lack of police action or the apparent lack of police action? Um, so it, for Predator, the first documentary that we um, made, which came out last year, we uh, approached the police um, uh, because obviously we they're a big part of the story as well. Um, we were told that... Um, that uh, there were, it would be difficult for us as um, journalists outside of Japan to be able to speak to them, which um, we found very odd. Um, and uh, and yeah, uh, the uh, for Predator Two, because of uh, oh, for Shadow of a Predator, uh, for our experiences uh, that we went through with Predator, um, our first Predator, we we. Um, uh, uh, we we were left thinking we couldn't approach them again. But I do think, again, as you say, we're not. Uh, we, the situation in Japan is different to uh, the situation in London. But it does feel like of a, 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 a an abuse a story of this scale of this um, um, volume. The police not moving um, does feel odd to me. Thank you, Megumi. Uh Anything to add to that, Mobin? No, I think Meg covered it. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, can you comment on the claims? You you do air them a little bit in your in your program, but can you compensate? Or sorry, can you discuss the sort of claims that the company is trying to penny pinch on the compensation or to tone down the compensation claims? As we said, a thousand people apparently have come forward, or about a thousand people have come forward. Um, are, are you able to comment on that at all, on the fact that some of them appear to be the victim of penny-pinching? 
Yeah, I mean, I would say certainly the information that we found, and this is this is all from conversations uh, with with survivors themselves, from from a lawyer that is representing a, a group of survivors, and then from the conversations we had at the company, it it didn't seem so much to be about minimizing the amount of compensation itself. That didn't seem to be the issue. The issue seemed to be uh, a culture in which people who were coming forward were discouraged. And actually kind of establishing a precedent where there is a, a feeling where if you decide you're you're going to come forward or even before that, if you're in the process of making that decision and deciding that you want to come forward and contact the company, there seems to be a culture which is being nurtured, which is to let people know that it's going to be difficult, that they're going to be discouraged. And we see that, for example, in the statement that smile up put on their website i know the the statement was was subsequently removed but the idea of you know the phrase that was used was false stories and testimony being stolen from from genuine survivors and i think what that does is it adds to the sense of stigma it adds to the sense of difficulty i just want to say you know we we have to imagine that if there are adults who are sending that initial email or who are making that initial call it takes a huge amount of courage it really does you know this is this is a a life changing thing that they'll be doing because they'll be starting a process potentially where yes there'll be compensation they'll be starting a process where they'll start counseling it could change their relationship with their families um it's going to change you know many things that they they may have and will have in many cases you know kept away from the surface of their life will now be brought back to the surface. So it's a huge undertaking. And so I think for the company to, to create a culture in which essentially they're saying, we don't believe that all of you are telling the truth here or that many of you are telling the truth here. I, I don't think that's, that's progressive or compassionate. And I think in this instance, we have to be led by compassion. Of course we do. Megumi? Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've said this before, at, at the heart of this is about protecting children, protection of children. It's, um, and Star, Smile Up and Star 2 are still companies that are responsible of young talent and developing them for a company to, in this situation, uh, as Mabin says, have a culture where the compensation process is uh, an interrogation, what seems like more of an interrogation, rather than a way to um, uh, understand where the, uh, what the survivors are going through, I think is a, is a huge misstep. Um, and uh, and um, yeah, it, it's, it's again, not actually grasping their responsibility and their duty that they have to the carer survivors and the current talent that they're responsible of. I just, I just want to add one one very brief thing. Uh, just going back to the idea of uh, the smile up, you know, creating the situation in which they introduced us to survivors of abuse. One of the people with all good intention, I'm sure, actually used a very particular phrase. You know, they said the abuse was bad, but it wasn't that bad. And it's been exaggerated. And I think this idea that there's been an exaggeration is itself really insensitive and really illustrates that there's a huge lack of understanding about the impact this has had on people's lives. Um, the other, just on that subject, well, on the subject of the company recruiting people, um, one of the big issues, of course, was a lack of media scrutiny or, you know, over these historical allegations, which went back a long time, right? They were publicly aired 20, 30, 40 years ago. And that, of course, allowed the company to keep recruiting these children uh, from their legal guardians. Um, have you seen any evidence that recruitment has fallen off or did you interview any parents who express concern about their children now going into the company or is that also business as usual, do you think? Uh, I think that's a really important and uh, interesting thing to look at. On this occasion, we didn't go um, down that route, but again, I would love to learn more about that. And... Um, Mobin, you seem surprised by the reaction of some of the fans. They seem to be also kind of putting it behind them and not that concerned. I do, and I'd say there's a there's a there's a real dividing line. So, 
you know, in the world we live in now, hyper con hyper connected world, I every morning uh, I will have messages on X or emails from people who are either saying um, they're really pleased this story continues to be covered and other individuals who are saying, you know, they are either survivors of abuse or that they they have um, had really neg negative experiences on the on on the streets, for example, or there's a culture of overlooking misogyny or sexual abuse or the persecution of gay people. You know, it's really become a kind of lightning rod in terms of lots of different social issues in Japan, and lots of people reach out to me. So that will be one camp. But then I have to say, in terms of a lot of the chatter on social media, there seems to be uh, many fans who are taking this extremely personally and see this as an attack on the acts that they love. And in that sense, it feels that like there's a whole section of the fandom that just wants this to go away. They just see it as kind of annoying white noise and they just want it to end. And I would appeal directly to all those people to really consider the impact this is having on people's lives. Thank you. Megumi, do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I think Mubin summarized it well. Thank you. All right. Just one last question. Um, there is a uh, an ongoing scandal here, which you may be aware of, uh, completely unrelated, of course, to the one we're discussing, um, by a famous comedian, uh, Matsumoto uh, Hitoshi. Hitoshi, have you have you come across that at all? Um, and um, do you think it's in any way relevant, not just what happened, but the follow up by the media? Because Matsumoto san has actually. Uh, temporarily retired yeah following the media coverage um so uh i have been watching you know reading um bits about it from uh, from the uk um i think what's happening is 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 um like an extension of mabeem was talking about really about how there is this symbiotic relationship between uh the media and the entertainment industry and there is this production line of entertainment. And uh, in the case of Matsumoto Hitoshi, uh, he is um, his 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 uh, company is a huge, huge talent agency as well, a comedian agency called Yoshimoto Kogyo. Um, and so I think that uh, it's um, uh, this a similar uh, what do you call it? a similar situation is happening there. Um, but I, I can't speak um, in detail further more than that, as I'm not actually aware of all all the um, yeah uh, details. All right. I, I would just add one one thing, and again, I'm not an expert on this, but I do think there's a disconnect between some of the testimony that I've seen online and people coming forward in the social media space and saying they were affected and saying this is a kind of Me Too movement for Japan. There seems to be a disconnect between that and then a lot of the reporting, and you know whether it's smile up or whether it's any other scandals in this in this area i would really appeal to journalists on the ground in japan to to chase these stories because i think they're worthwhile stories and when we have these uncomfortable difficult conversations in any society including here in the uk that is how society moves forward it's the job of journalists to hold up a mirror to society uh, even when you know, the reflection may be ugly and when those conversations might be difficult. And that's a universal thing that isn't exclusive to Japan. And it's certainly not exclusive to the UK and Europe, but it is our job as journalists. And I would appeal to, to all of us who have a platform, who have a publication, who work for a TV station or the radio station to, to do our jobs and chase those stories. Thank you very much. Um, well, uh, thank you to uh, to Mobin and Megumi for getting up early to uh, join us today. What time is it there, guys? It's just, just coming up to 8 o'clock. Just turning now, 8. Yeah. And I think it's safe to say that Megumi is a new mom, so it was especially difficult for you to, to do this. Thanks a million for doing that. Um, can I just remind everybody uh, present that uh, the documentary, the full documentary is available to watch on BBC News Channel, which uh, I'm told is available on uh, Amazon Prime Video in Japan. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So you can watch it. Uh, does that have, have subtitles? Um, does, do, do either of you know, or is it just 
it has yeah, subtitles. Yes, it will. Okay, so yeah. it is so it is available to watch if you would like to do that. Um, any last words before we let you go? Thank you so much. I just want to say thank you to to everyone, and I I do just really appeal to journalists on the ground to to continue running with this story and continue fighting for justice. I really do. Megumi? Uh, same here. The story isn't over. Um, we'll certainly be watching it from London, but I hope that journalists uh, in Japan um, also do. Um, and thank you again for having us here today. Well, thank you both. The story isn't over. I think that's the, the message from you both. The story isn't over, yeah? Okay, thank you so much, and do show your appreciation for today's speakers. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks.